So this is the CIW annual lecture. It's the fifth annual lecture. Um, there's a kind of, in, in Chinese culture and history, there is a cycle of 60 years is very important. This is a kind of cycle of five years because the first CIW annual lecture was given by tonight's lecturer, uh, Jeremy Vane, in 19, uh, 2011, on the theme Australia and China in the world, whose literacy. He was followed in 2012 by Professor Wang Gungwu, a member of our advisory board, who spoke on China's choices. In 2013, the former Vice-Chancellor of the ANU, Ian Chubb, AO, now still, I think, the Chief Scientist for another short time, spoke on Partners in Influence, How China and Australia Relate Through Science. And last year, 2014, the annual lecture was given by Mr. Gerald Sito, who I'm very pleased to say is in the audience tonight. Gerald is normally resident in Beijing. He is the inspirational architect of the buildings that we have here. He spoke indeed on the architecture of education in Canberra and Beijing. Tonight, Jeremy gives his second lecture, but in a different capacity. Jeremy is now the founding director of CIW. And he speaks on the topic of new Sinology in the Xi Jinping era. To introduce this particular lecture, I'm, I think there's probably no better way than to quote Jeremy himself 10 years ago. New Sinology is a, a term that uh, entered into Sinological discussion, if you will, at least in Australia, in a, a small magazine, a small newsletter, called the Chinese Studies Association of Australia Newsletter. And in issue number 31 of May 2005, Jeremy wrote an article about new Sinology. And with your forbearance, I'd like to read some of it. The concept behind this rather nebulous expression, new Sinology, is a simple one. And one that to many colleagues who are engaged with things Chinese will not appear to be particularly new. I speak of new Sinology as being descriptive of a robust engagement with contemporary China and indeed with the Sinophone world in all of its complexity, be it local, regional, or global. It affirms a conversation and intermingling that also emphasizes strong scholastic underpinnings in both the classical and modern Chinese language and studies, at the same time as encouraging an ecumenical attitude in relation to a rich variety of approaches and disciplines, whether they be mainly empirical or more theoretically inflected. In seeking to emphasize innovation within Sinology by recourse to the word new, it is nonetheless evident that I continue to affirm the distinctiveness of Sinology as a mode of intellectual inquiry. Implicit in the inquiry of new Sinology is an abiding respect for the written and spoken forms of Chinese as these have evolved over the centuries. New Sinology can thus also be described as an unrelenting attentiveness to Sinophone ways of speaking writing and seeing, and to the different forces that have shaped the evolution of Sinophone texts and images, as well as Sinophone ways of sense-making. Textually, the interests of new Sinology range from the specificities of canonical and authoritative formulations in both the classical language, or rather the languages of the pre-dynastic and dynastic eras, and the modern vernacular to the many inventive bylines that have emerged more recently in our media saturated times. So those of us who know Jeremy and have read his work will recognize how new Sinology can and should be done. As an approach, it is the guiding light of research in this center. As a practice, it has become for many of us simply how we do our work. And that's huge praise. Ten years ago, when Jeremy's article on New Sinology was published, Hu Jintao had been General Secretary of the Central Committee of the Party and President of the People's Republic for only a couple of years. Wen Jiabao was the new Premier. In January of that year, Zhao Ziyang, the reforming General Secretary of the Party in the late 1980s, had died. In April, it was the turn of Zhang Chunqiao, and in December, that of Yao Wenyuan, the last two surviving members of the Gang of Four. Somehow, 
2005, when Jeremy wrote the initial article, seems a very long time ago. We are now firmly in the era of Xi Jinping. Things have changed. So now I'd like to invite Jeremy to address us on exactly how they have changed and what a new Sinology might look like in this new era. Thanks, Jeremy. I hope not to quote too much of myself. I've tried to write something new on this topic. Um, and I'd first like to acknowledge Lois Connor, whose image graces the screen at the moment, and many of whose images will appear during this evening's talk. Um, if you understand my interest in China's contemporary inflections and classical dimensions, you'll appreciate why that picture looks like it is. By the way, in the background, it's, not the, it's a picture of the Forbidden City on a hoarding over the other side of the street, and Lois is taking an image of a picture on another building reflected in a window with shinwazari fans. So it sort of sums up my whole lecture, so I can go home now. Um, traditionally, the 28th of September marks the birthday of the Chinese sage Confucius. It also happens to be the birthday of a man by the name of Pierre Whitmans, also known or famous under the pen name of Simon Leys. He was formerly a Chinese teacher here at the ANU. In fact, Pierre taught me Chinese, and indeed, he was my doctoral supervisor and also my mentor. Here's Pierre about 50 years ago in Hong Kong, looking out over a body of water with his seal, the Keman, and that of his, uh, his wife, now widow, Han Fang. Um, I mention this because Pierre passed away just over a year ago. And to mark the anniversary of this loss, as well as to commemorate his 80th birthday, he would have been 80 this last September 28th, curators of the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney worked with his wife, Han Fang, or his widow, Han Fang, the art historian, Claire Roberts, also a doctoral <laughs> graduate of ANU, one of my students, but also an MA student of Pierre's, to put, a display, put on display five Chinese ink paintings from Pierre and Han Fang's private collection. This is one of the images by Su Ren Shan, an extraordinary eccentric and little known Guangdong artist, who Pierre made famous. Um, we don't have time to go into the details, but anyway, the event was held last Wednesday on the 21st of October, and Michael Brand, the director of the gallery, yet another ANU graduate, hosted a dinner for the friends, admirers, scholars, and public figures who had gathered in Sydney to commemorate Pierre's life his writing and his artistic insights. Next to the podium at that dinner, there was a piece of calligraphy on display. Sorry, I took it, it's got this terrible reflection in the picture, so forgive me. Um, it's, it is in the hand of the noted outstanding calligrapher Huang Miaozi, a very old friend, both of us, who passed away a few years ago. Miaozi wrote this for Pierre in the 1980s when he left ANU, I'm afraid in a bit of a huff, and took up the chair of the Department of East Asian Studies at Sydney University, therefore the dedication, for those of you who read Chinese. It is a calligraphic work from one of the most famous sayings in Chinese. It comes from the Confucian Analects, that's the connection back to Confucius, and it reads simply, in Chinese, within the four seas, all men are brothers. And yes, it's gendered, it's men, shungdi. Elder and younger brother, I'm sorry, it's 5th century BC, it's just the way they wrote stuff. <coughs> In his address at the dinner, Michael Brand quoted Pierre's 1996 ABC Boyer lectures. In the last of the four lecture series, Pierre offered a meditation on culture, both at home and abroad. Pierre observed, popular imagination often associates the great age of China with a picture of the Great Wall. So this is a close-up of the Great Wall. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, it really is. And tourists tend to, I can do one of those stock shops, they so boring. Um, and tourists tend to view this monument as a symbol of China's antiquity and power. In fact, it can represent neither. It is not very ancient, by Chinese standards at least, and in Chinese history, it is associated with a phenomenon of decadence and incipient paralysis. A civilization is strong in proportion to its capacity to tolerate within itself what is foreign to itself. Once it loses this bold confidence and the natural resilience of its own values, once it feels a defensive need to surround itself with walls in order to keep out the outside, to keep the outside world at bay 
its very survival becomes problematic. Not, after those, not long after those lectures were broadcast in 1996, you'll all remember, a Liberal coalition government led by John Howard would be ruling the country from the city, Canberra. That regime change, the regime change, ushered in a decade during which a long shadow was cast over Australian cultural perspectives, university life and social values. As the local version of the culture and history wars unfolded, new Antipodean great walls were thrown up. Ten years before the rise of the Howard government, John Minford, another ANU graduate and presently professor of Chinese literature here at the university, and I edited a book titled Seeds of Fire, Chinese Voices of Conscience, it appeared in 1986. The first thematic section of the book was called Walls, and we began with a quotation from a short lapidary essay by the great Chinese writer Lu Xun, written some 50 years earlier in 1935. In it, Lu Xun said, I have always felt hemmed in on all sides by the Great Wall, that wall of ancient bricks which is constantly being reinforced. The old and the new conspire to confine us all. When will we stop adding new bricks to that wall? The Great Wall of China, a wonder and a curse. This is more stock image. As many of you know, since my illness, I am much given to ruminating about my sense of living into the past. Who would have thought that as Howard and Ilk rose to power and influence two decades ago, a distant lament about great walls of the mind in China would strike a chord with me here at home. But I also took Pierre's remarks about cultural defensiveness and narrowness to be a comment on the continued predicament of the life of the mind and the heart in the People's Republic of China. After all, 1996 was only a few years after the political and cultural cataclysm that followed in the wake of the 4th of June, 1989. Since then, the Communist Party state, apart from the crude instruments of political repression, would increasingly bolster its rule through nationalism and the promotion of Chinese exceptionalism. We're different, like the Americans, we're different from everybody else. In the early 1990s, between pursuing work on a post doctoral fellowship here at ANU and working on a film project in Boston, I frequently traveled to China. And in the post-1989 malaise, I sought out academics, thinkers, and strategists at various points in the Chinese political and cultural spectrum. Among their number were outspoken activists like Liu Xiaobo, later of Nobel Peace Prize fame, who I had interviewed during his first flush of fame in 1986. There was then the raffish and wealthy hooligan novelist Wang Suo and the journalist historian Dai Qing. There were also thinkers like the pro-Confucian values conservative Xiao Gongqin, Republican historian, the great liberal intellectual historian Xu Jilin, the fledgling political scientist Liu Qing, as well as the pro-party strategist and obnoxious Mr. He Xin. Among their number were also younger, brash, up-and-coming xenophobic nationalists like Wang Xiaodong and Yang Ping, now very famous and very influential, who were involved with the blood-curdling journal known as Strategy and Management. Probably none of you know that, but if you want to really discuss yourselves, go read that. <laughs> the Chinese Young Turks, these Young Turks, were in, um, in particular took great relish in lecturing me and finger-wagging finger certainty on how I should think and how I should abandon my noxious Western biases. Sorry. <laughs> this is not particularly affronting, after all, for someone like me. After all, in my early 20s, when I was 20, 21, 2, 3, 4, I'd lived in China in the Cultural Revolution, and I'd been lectured at by the best of them, <laughs> by the army leaders of the Mao Zedong thought propaganda teams that ran the universities where I studied. After that, any shrill con condescension and finger-wagging seemed mild by comparison. But what did these th thinkers discern in China's future? Liu Xiaobo would famously become a more trenchant pro-Western liberal, and he's paying a terrible price for that. Dai Qing, now much older, had faith that the party would gradually create a moderate, law-abiding civilian government. Pity about that. Always ahead of his time, Wang Shuo abandoned his insightful fiction and indulged in the lifestyle that his success, wild wealth, allowed him to enjoy. Other artist friends would emigrate and enjoy success 
as migratory cultural bowerbirds. As for the hardliners, well, they've done well. I wrote up what message I thought I had gleaned from them about China's future in an academic article under the title, To Screw Foreigners is Patriotic. <laughs> <laughs> That's rather infamous now. In their search for meaning, a search beyond China's century-long quest for wealth and power, back then you could already make out the mainstream values of pro-party patriots. They promoted a mixture of strong state and secular power, radical materialism, quasi-mythic talk of Chinese uniqueness, cultural essence, and some gym crack form of collectivist state Confucianism. This dialectical materialist, well, it's a mashup, was and is held together by a regnant Communist Party that was shaped in the Maoist crucible of discourse and ideas about serving the people while supporting elements of state-directed neoliberal market reform with constant repressive police action. <coughs> now, Xi Jinping, Ben mentioned, took over the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party in November 2012. And as many people have commented, in the three years since, he has amassed more titles and power than any leader since Mao Zedong himself. In fact, Xi Dada, Uncle Xi, Big Daddy Xi, as he's known in the Chinese media, is so burdened by office that I have dubbed him myself China's COE, Chairman of Everything. <laughs> Upon his elevation, Xi Jinping immediately announced that as part of the, quote, revitalization of the great Chinese nation, an idea that had been first made prominent under Party General Secretary Jiang Zemin in the 1990s, he would lead the country to realize the China dream. The China dream, like so many elements of Chinese political life, is something of a doppelganger of things American. You see, it's inspired by the American dream, and the China dream was first articulated in the Olympic year, but that was all forgotten in 2012. In the 1930s, when the American dream was first spoken of, it was described as the following. It is that dream of a land in which life should be better and fuller for every man, with opportunity for each according to his ability or achievement unhampered by the barriers with which, which had slowly been erected in the older civilizations, i.e. Europe, unrepressed by social orders which had developed for the benefit of classes rather than for the simple human beings of any and every class. Today the China dream is about the individual realizing their aspirations in the context of a dreamscape determined by the Chinese Communist Party, and woe betide those who dream the wrong dreams. But Xi Jinping is yet to really develop the leitmotif of his period of rule. There are rumors that he is developing a new theoretical construct that will be revealed in the next year or so. But his rule may last a decade, another seven years. It may last a little less if you believe the Australian newspaper of today, which spoke about attempted coups and assassinations. Or it may, for those of us who believe in a North Korean solution, last a little bit longer. Is it going to be the last stand of the Chinese Communist Party and its theoretical <coughs> carapace? Or merely a way stop on a much greater journey that China has undertaken for nearly 150 years now? A journey that I've called about, called the Grand Conciliation, that is, the reconciliation between late dynastic behavior and ideas and institutions and thoughts, the Republican era richness of diversity and possibility and institutions of a modern society and the Maoist, as well as the dumbest legacies of mixed Leninism and state capitalism with the market. This grand conciliation is still taking place and is yet to unfold in its full complexity and it will continue to do so for decades to come. So as they say, well, when one said about the so-called French Revolution, what were the results of the French Revolution too early to say? Mm -hmm. That's actually a misquotation. That won't go into the details. In question time, I can tell you why. That's but will this conciliation continue? I have no doubt it will. It will combine elements of the dynastic past, the high socialist era, and this period of reform we have seen unfolding now. As we know, Xi Jinping pursues stricter discipline and renewed high ethical standards for the 80 million or so Communist Party members, reviving hopes that have re reinvigorated communist organization, though still essentially secretive, and Leninist, with elements of Maoism in it, will be able to pursue a mass line, a semi-Chinese form of democracy, 
in which the people have some say, although it's a guided say, and they're usually told what to, they want rather than really expressing all of their needs, but using, as Xi Jinping does, the old mechanisms of criticism and self-criticism, as well as public shaming and choking bureaucratic demands to inspire cadres and public figures, aiding them on to ever greater heights of achievement. This is, at the moment, the Xi Jinping model. It's not universally popular within the party or outside it. After all, such strategies for enlivening society and bureaucracy have not been particular, particularly successful in China in the past. And in a period of increased party surveillance, due to the ongoing anti-corruption drive and demands for greater loyalty for party cadres, this is a perilous time indeed. After all, they confront a pitfall littered socio-political landscape and a system that creates a reality-distorting force field of self-promotion. It's still called propaganda in Chinese. And after nearly four decades of economic reform and social change, at every turn, Chinese communists must deal, must deal with for something that I have for some time called the other China. Now, most of you have visited the other China, or may have plans to go there, or even live there. Now, I'm not talking about just Taiwan. I'm not talking about that other China. I'm talking not about the two-China scenario. I'm speaking about the broader Chinese world with which we here in the center and Australia in the world, the China in the world, um, engage. It is a China of liveliness, invention, and imagination. One that, despite all the glum policies and the control of Big Daddy Xi and the party apparat, can be glimpsed at frequently in the People's Republic of China, and that is also vitally alive in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and in communities throughout the world. It is that other China that is alive, well, part of the international community and burgeoning. It is a multicultural, multidimensional China, the members of which draw inspiration not only from a rich past, but also from the boundless contemporary energy that they enjoy. It is a China that often flourishes despite, and not because of what the Communist Party does, although when the party lets China be more itself than its communist other, it does very well. It is a China that I sometimes think is summed up well in, in a line from Clive James, a great Australian author, who said, in culture, there is never an innovation that does not spring from a tradition, because the interweaving of innovation and tradition is what culture is. And that, I think, is exactly the phenomenon we deal with, with China. Certainly, the Chinese reform era of these past decades has supported the growth of this other China, but also fr frustrates and hinders it. What will this other China become? Will it be stymied by ambitious party leaders with a 19th century worldview egged on by encirclement by Western powers and jealous others? And will they be frustrated in their titanic aspirations for the 21st century? These are some of the big questions that we all deal with. As Ben mentioned, the way I have proposed to engage with this other China, as well as with official China, is through an approach I first articulated in 2005, New Sinology. But I have the other China picture, and I wouldn't want to that because it's just sort of relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a sinology or study of things Chinese. Sinology is actually a translation from Chinese of the term Han Xie. That is the study of the learning of the Han dynasty that became the basis for all educated, um, educated people in China from the 2nd, 3rd century AD onwards. It was called the body of Han learning, Han dynasty learning. And Han Xie, translating into English, is sinology. So when Westerners first encountered this body of learning, they were encountering the body of Han learning, codified learning in classical texts and so on and so forth, that they felt they had to read and understand to engage with China. So that's what Sinology started off as 480 years ago. Um, <clears throat> but I spoke about the new Sinology, linking back to this history in the 1580s, that first engagement between Jesuit missionaries and Chinese thinkers. 430 years, sorry, ago. On the other hand, I was also interested in a new sinology that engaged with a post-China studies world. China studies is the study of China in the Cold War context, American-based, it originated, it's a very particular intellectual lineage, now much ignored and misunderstood by those who use it. I was interested in a post-Cold War study of China and a post-colonial study of China. A Chinese world that was important to understand by truly educating people about and doing research on the thinking, speaking, and acting Chinese world of today and its traditional, revived, as well as 20th century underpinnings. 
over the past decade, I've written at length on this subject, and I won't bore you with by repeating it all here. It's all online, the chinastory.org site that we produce for this centre. Then suffice to say that in propounding a new synology, it was to a great extent merely stating, as Ben had said, the obvious and recalling the views of generations of scholars of China, both in China and elsewhere, including my own teachers. I was also giving an updated account of arguments made very clearly in 1961, believe it or not, by the, one of the great professors of Chinese here, Liu Cunin, by one of the great professors at Oxford University, David Hawkes, and also by a group of leading American-based China scholars, historians, and others, at a symposium. They, this latter group, was at a symposium organized by the Association of Asian Studies in 1961, titled simply Chinese Studies and the Disciplines. I would encourage those interested in that debate to look up the arguments made then, in particular if they are still relevant today, but let me just quote from one of the participants, the great Harvard intellectual historian Benjamin Schwartz. Ben, who I had the great pleasure of becoming friendly with in his later years, summed up his views of the kind of infectious insularity of the disciplines that was already suffocating serious academic work on China in an essay that he just titled, The Fetish of Disciplines. Obviously not a fan. In that essay he said, whatever a man's discipline, the broader and deeper his general culture, his general education, the more willing he is to bring whatever wisdom he has to bear on the subject he is treating. Whether this wisdom derives from the methodology of this discipline or not, it increases the likelihood of his saying something significant. Conversely, the mechanical application of an isolated discipline narrowly conceived in terms of a self-contained model or system to a culture, whether contemporary or traditional, which has not been studied in any of its other aspects by a person of limited culture, may lead to sterile and even preposterous results. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Without this approach, one that in relation to China I call new sinology, what we are left with is a kind of clerical academia. It is one in which China and things Chinese are generally reduced to, to being a kind of intellectual footnote to the international and acceptable disciplines. And they're promoted specialists in the quest for tidy outcomes which reduce the scope of teaching and learning. At a time of increased need, that is in the Xi Jinping era, many find themselves disarmed and variously ill-lettered apologists and careerists arise in their wake. Don't want to get in there. Centers of power. It is ironic that as the Xi Jinping era demands a familiarity with the various modes of Chinese language and thought as never before. If you ever listen to a Xi Jinping speech, heaven forbid that you should, he quotes the classics constantly. Whenever you deal with contemporary Chinese strategists, economists, regional specialists, cultural thinkers, sociologists, if you don't have a basic understanding of classical Chinese knowledge, thought, and the way meaning is made using those bodies of thought, you really don't know what you're talking about or what you're listening to. It's just the matter of reality that we deal with. However, at this crucial time, and as we need this type of training and education understanding as never before, because Xi Jinping is a boon to a new sinologist. What a gift to us all, boring though he may be, it happens to be that he and his colleagues are making sense of a world that is different. Oh, horrors that there's something different from the Anglo-American way of doing things. <coughs> I mark, and as I mark the decades since the publication of New Sinology, some five years before it had become the founding principle of our Australian Centre on China World, this more holistic teaching and study of China at the undergraduate and graduate level, in particular instruction in literary Chinese, a basic familiarity with the building blocks of that culture is being cauterized by those who will see what a major teaching institute, to see a major teaching institution, or many major institutions, reduced to Confucius-like rumps. For those of you who don't know, literary or classical Chinese is that living language that gives serious students of the Chinese world access to everything from the headlines of the Chinese press. Yeah, you actually can't read most headlines in a newspaper if you don't have basic literary Chinese. Isn't that embarrassing? Um, yes, they're written in the telegraphic style of the classics. You can't read advice papers to the Politburo because to have any impact you have to write a type of literary Chinese. Or letters of protest because they're written in that style too. 
you can't understand a kung fu movie. How pathetic is that? <laughs> well, let alone a kung fu novel, which is just <laughs> one of the most popular forms of Chinese literature ever produced. Um, nor can you understand material from the storehouse of historical records or the philosophical text, just the basics, even the Reader's Digest version. That's the version that people like Wen Jiabao and Xi Jinping actually use. <laughs> but they're the things that are drawn upon to make sense of China and its place in the world today and to not suffer from what I've elsewhere called translated China. That is relying on Chinese commentators and propagandists to understand China's reality. If you actually want to understand the reality for yourself, you have to get some learning, and it's not going to be provided by the English language sources. These are all crucial things to us dealing with the Xi Jinping era. As Xi Jinping more than any other leader since Mao is using Chinese ideas, ways of seeing, doing, and talking to create Chinese realities, whether we like it or not. The pedagogical disavowal of this kind of approach will mean that students that we train will not be able to recognize the bricks in these new structures, let alone gauge the dimensions of the walls with which they are confronted, and which only the brave among them might hope to scale. That's the less successful ones. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, a bit of levity. And again, Lois Connors, BDI, the I mean, ran a couple of months ago. Oh, you may say, this is all such arcane stuff, more suited to the China boffin of the past. It's really not the kind of thing people like us should expect of students or general China scholars or others working on China today. Well, I say that such a reaction is that of those interested merely in the narrow, the transactional, and the exploitative. I would go so far as to say that such an attitude is something of a colonial relic and, then we're done, and one that does not bother taking the country that we're interested in seriously beyond what it can do to enhance academic CVs, share portfolios, and to further careers. If we are interested in this major civilizational center, one which is at the core of life in Asia and the Pacific, then there have to be places like this that teach about the civilization in its various dimensions and that do research into it and educate the public about it beyond the requirements of the contemporary money-obsessed and metric-driven <coughs> education industry. That is one of the reasons why this centre exists, how we cajole money out of the government to do it. It's supposedly, supposedly one of the reasons that this College of Asia in the Pacific exists, and is why we have been celebrating here in this centre the proud ANU history of the study of China in an exhibition put together by William, young scholar William Seimer and our curator and postdoctoral fellow Olivia Krisha. That's a little picture. And it's the, the, the um, exhibition will be open after this lecture. If you haven't seen it, please have a pop in and do have a, have a look. Extraordinary example of the work of young scholars on this subject. ANU's foundation, which will mark its 70th year next year, um, was imbricated, involved closely with China and discussions about China and East Asia and the Pacific from its very origins. So does a new sonology matter beyond educating a few people in the overlap between dynastic, republican, and people's republic China? Is it a mere academic <coughs> indulgence? Or does it partake of a near 500 year history among thinking people from a Western background who, would have for generation, who have for generations taken seriously Chinese ways of thinking, speaking, and acting? I would argue that it does, and that for us to abandon that rich tradition is both foolhardy and perilous at a time when China plays an increasingly important role globally and in our own neighborhood. If there is such a thing as a China choice, Pache, Hugh White, or choices in the era trumpeted by our present Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull as being the most exciting time to be an Australian, we had better have an idea of what we stand for, where we stand, and why we're standing at all. I believe new sinology is one of the keys to doing this. Now, there's originally in this speech a long excursion of three lessons in new sinology to actually give you examples of what I mean, but we'd be here all night if I did. I'll publish them online. One, just very quickly, one of them relates to something that happened in England last week in Manchester. Xi Jinping visited a high school in Manchester, and the school had been told by the Chinese embassy the children there in the Confucius classroom, that is one of those communist funded things, um, had to recite Xi Dada, Big Daddy Xi's poem to the communist martyr Zhao Yulu, who died in 1964. Getting obscure enough for you? And Xi Dada had written the poem 
in the form of a Song Dynasty, 11th century song lyric poem in obscure classical Chinese. And he'd written it in 1990, which was the year I mentioned earlier when they were reviving nationalism, patriotism, and culture and re-emphasizing re re party power after the June 4th massacre. And he'd written in a style that is reminiscent of Chairman Mao's 1937 poem called Snow, but we don't have time to go into any of that. Anyway, nobody understood why the hell these kids had to recite this ridiculously impossible poem to Xi Jinping when he came. He knew why, as did everybody with any education in China. And we don't have people who are trained to at least understand why that might be important. I think it is of vague interest, at least. Anyway, you can read online my lessons in New Sinology later on when I publish them. But to continue, <laughs> forgive me for that excursion. New Sinology is a hardly touchy-feely thing. This is one reason why I have so frequently employed the ancient Chinese word zhongyong to describe this type of engagement. It's a term I use to describe the robust demeanor of those who would engage with the outspoken, feisty, and aggrieved world of China's party state today and those in through all of its education and propaganda. You'd better be ready to be screamed at and finger we at if you're going to engage with it at all. It's not just all other China niceness and flirtation. The idea of the Zhongyo. Zhongyo is an ancient term, as I said. It means a principled or candid advisor or friend. Underlies also collegiality and the healthy educational relationship in universities. A boisterous intellectual exchange. Well, at least it did. From 2008, I have used the term in various places and in various ways, not only as a describing a stance for those critically engaged with China, but also as a way to deal with one's own powers that be. After all, to be frank and aware, you also require an empathy that must be alert to the problems of the marginal, the victimized, and the ignored. That is why, in the lead up to Xi Jinping's investiture in 2012, as the head of China's party, state, and army, that's right, he's the head of everything, COE, as I said, um, I translated an essay at that time by a man by the name of Yuan Peng. Yuan Peng was one of those delightful characters that they generate so frequently in China. He's a strategic thinker who works for the Beijing think tank, the China Institutes of Contemporary International Relations, an institute that this center has many dealings with and Ben Penny just visited quite recently as part of a long-term collaboration. It's a think tank directly aligned to the Ministry of State Security. It's one of the reasons we deal with them, because at least you're dealing with real spies as opposed to the phony spies at all the other institutions. <laughs> In mid-2012, Yuan Peng wrote an advice paper to the Politburo, and he produced a popular version of it, which I translated into English, because it was in a newspaper, thank heavens. That sort of sums up my attitude to the whole thing. Anyway, um, he wrote an advice paper. And in it, he said that China had, from 2012, a three to five year period of strategic opportunity. And he's probably right. I, much of this I don't deny at all. Um, that the country enjoyed this period. Although China could take advantage of a relative American economic and strategic decline and weakness, relative only, he also warned that during this period, that is the first period, the first five years of Xi Jinping's rule, the US would continue using local surrogates and agents of influence to undermine the People's Republic, which is a long-term American strategy from the 1950s, which it is, it's not a lie. Yuan declared in the, in the period up to 2017, and I quote, the US will avail itself of various non-military means to delay or hinder China's progressive rise. In so doing, it will hope to gain strategic advantage, revitalize itself, and consolidate its global hegemonic position. Again, I think he's probably completely correct. Among other things, Yuan Peng, you'll see why this is important in a moment, identified five groups in China that could well threaten the society's stability. It's a hit list. He said the US would use these groups. The groups are, he said, in the name of internet freedom, they believe in transforming the traditional mode of pursuing top-down democracy and freedom as part of their strategy. They will utilize rights lawyers, that is, lawyers who fight for individual rights. They will use underground religious activists. They will exploit dissidents in China, internet leaders, and they will also encourage rebellious, vulnerable groups in the society. These will be their core constituencies, 
that they will use with the aim of infiltrating China's grassroots so as to carry out a bottom-up process to create conditions to transform, that is, overturn China's Communist Party. Again, probably all correct. In essence, Yuan provided the incoming leaders in this essay, and there's a longer internal version, of course, with a hit list of the groups that had to be attacked or neutralized during the first five years of Xi Jinping's rule. <laughs> Guess what's happened? Back in 2012, his list had outraged many people, but in retrospect, we can clearly see it is thinkers like Yuan Peng who have helped inform party state policy under Xi Jinping. It's like the central government has gone through the checklist and wiped out or cauterized every group bit by bit over the last five years. In the era of the China dream, the cloak of the collective is used to muffle difference and diversity. China today is once more a nation of walls in many ways. Whether they are spoken of in terms of Chinese characteristics, they denote a closing of the Chinese mind. And we don't have time to go into details, but I work with academics in China, and I can assure you that's where things are going. But none, none, not only do we require an empathy, not only for Chinese difference, and to understand the mechanisms of party control and rule, but also, more broadly, the difference within the Chinese world and how it is being understood and used and dealt with in the Xi Jinping era. Here, if I had time, I'd go into greater detail about the problems related to both Tibet and Xinjiang and how I think they are changing in this particular period. I would just say that one of the compromising things that we must deal with as people here in Australia in discussing policies towards Xinjiang and Tibet is that our own issues since the Howard era in particular related to our own indigenous peoples and also the policies generated by successive governments in relation to refugees giving Australia no longer any of the moral right or superiority it might have presumed to enjoy decades ago. We also appreciate the grotesque predicaments, not only of the minorities and, and, um, and vulnerable groups in places like China, but also those here in Australia that we have become witness to since the mid-1990s. We, after all, to repeat a line from Pierre, which I, with which I started this talk, we are a society that feels a defensive need to surround itself with walls in order to keep the outside world at bay. And as a result, its very survival becomes problematic. As Australia develops its strategic relationship with its neighbours and engages more closely with China, even in this era of relative boom, values continue to play some role. I've had no time to go into the debate in China about alternate values to the West. <coughs> but I'll just quote a very pressing comment made recently by a friend of the centres, well-known journalist by the name of John Garner, who has recently writes a lot about um, China, but also about regional affairs. And just recently on the weekend, he wrote a piece in which he spoke about Australia's attempts as the defence white paper is being prepared here in Canberra to realign itself with key democratic allies in our region. And he talks about what this might mean in real terms and, China's moral, and Australia's moral stance. He says, one weakness of a defence architecture that Australia is pursuing, built upon fine principles, is that it can be undermined by hypocrisy. India, Japan, the US and Australia, its close allies, have each been domestically inconsistent in upholding the principles of democracy, pluralism and rule of law that they propound, propound abroad, and particularly propound when they're dealing with China, and places like China. If India's Modi's loyalists like to see him as a superman, then Hindu chauvinism is his kryptonite. That's weird, right? It's very John Garner. In recent weeks, the Indian press has been consumed by his failure to convincingly condemn the murders of Muslims for allegedly killing cows and eating beef. This undermines the international quest for shared values. Just like Japan's airbrushing of history and Australia's obsession with unilaterally turning back refugees. It makes it harder to build bridges with the fifth and sixth major democracies in our region currently missing from our story, that is Indonesia and Korea. As the Chinese party state concocts its parallel value system based on selective Chinese characteristics and exceptionalism, as we question and resist the monolithic narratives that con constitute China's official China story, we are also aware of the assimilationist narrative of our own post-colonial state and what elsewhere I've spoken of as Australia's unfinished 20th century. 
I've also said the new Sinology is like a mirror, as Zheng Yong was described as a mirror in the, the Tang Dynasty. One that reflects not only other realities, but in which we too must discern our own features. The Tang Emperor who spoke of his wise minister Wei Zheng as being a jian, a mirror to himself, said he was a Zheng Yong because he also reflected reality back to himself. Now, before I finish, I just want to take an excursion because tomorrow we're officially opening this building. We had a soft, unofficial opening last May, which Gerald was at and spoke during. But the official opening will occur tomorrow, which we're very grateful for. It's only taken the government 18 months to get over, over the, the lake to come and see us. But I'd just like to give you a little bit of a story about how the building came up, how this place came about, because I've never sort of really spoken about it publicly before. You see, the year 2009, that's when it all happened, it was an important one for those of us interested in China. It's also the, see, the, sort of the year that saw the creation of the centre. On a national level, 2009 was a fraught year in the Australian-Chinese relationship, perhaps the most anxious period since the normalisation of diplomatic relations with the People's Republic since 1972. In fact, I think of 2009, and please forgive me, as our Annus Horribilis Sinensis. That's the synopsis of China. <clears throat> During it, there was a negative trifecta. First, in June 2009, there was a rancorous controversy rising from the failed bid by the huge Chinese aluminium corporation called Chinalco to invest in Rio Tinto. You care, you've forgotten, doesn't matter. This was followed in July by the arrest in China of the Australian Chinese businessman and Rio Tinto executive Stern Hu, culminating in his son imprisonment. And then there was the official Chinese fulminations over an invitation by the Melbourne International Film Festival to the Xinjiang or East Turkestan activist Rabia Kadir to attend a screening of a film about her life in August. The Chinese embassy, the Chinese authorities went crazy. The Chinese press was full of Australia leading an anti-China chorus globally and creating great problems for China internationally, etc., etc. You know that wonderful Maoist-style high dudgeon that the Chinese do so beautifully. Earlier in that year, there were suggestions that the ANU-trained Chinese-speaking Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, might turn out to be Australia's Manchurian candidate. <laughs> I'm not making any of this up. I'm quoting. In April, the Labour politician Kim Beasley even went so far as to openly criticise the head of the opposition, and by the name of Malcolm Turnbull, then the head of the coalition, now our Prime Minister, for suggesting that Rudd, and this is a quote, had assumed roving ambassador status for China. For a time, and for the first time in decades, the bipartisan political unity between the Labour Party and the Liberal Party collapsed, and there was a fracture, and it led to great consternation for those of us who care about relative sanity and, pol and continuity in policy. In any event, this wobble was a boon for those interested in the more serious engagement with China, and for us here at the ANU who wanted to build on our long heritage of studying the Chinese world. That year was also, and I'll get to why this is relevant in a moment, it was also, on an intimate ANU level, a year of great loss as well. Alastair Morrison, the son of George Morrison, whose name we celebrate with an annual lecture here at the university, and have done so now for many decades, passed away that year. Alistair was a supporter of this university and its work on China, in particular through the efforts of Claire Roberts and also because he shared generously had the work of his wife, Heather Morrison, with us all. Then in August of that year, David Hawkes, who I mentioned earlier, the great Oxford professor, translator and writer, and a friend of this place, passed away, followed the same month by the passing of our great professor of Chinese literature, thought, and philosophy, Professor Liu Tsunen, a teacher and guide into classical Chinese thought for many of us and for many years. It's a professor, a nice, beautiful professor. At the commemoration held at <coughs> Professor Liu at University House in late August 2009, after this Annus Horribilis Sinensis, a eulogy was sent by Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, who'd been one of Professor Liu's students. And it was read out by John Minford, who I mentioned earlier. In early September, Kevin invited me to the lodge for lunch over which we reminisced about Professor Liu, discussed the Sino-Australian Annus Horribilis, and then I told Kevin about my plans for a more holistic study of China, new sound and blah, blah, blah. Again, I spruiked the idea. <laughs> <clears throat> and he got interested and was enthralled, 
and offered support. And I found myself with colleagues entering into negotiations with the government over the creation of a new China concentration or center, eventually this place. And we got into writing vision statements, strategic plans, and blah, 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 all that stuff. And in the process, we encountered the arcana and the delights of the Prime Minister and Cabinet Office. The head of PMNC was particularly derisive about the new AAU Commonwealth collaborations, which included an extension of the Crawford School, uh, the creation of a national security college. Oh, and then there was us, which came late in the piece. And that is why <coughs> the head of the PMNC called us the steak knives. <laughs> We were that supplementary afterthought, that special little gift that Ian Chubb would be given if he was in that. <laughs> I'm not, honestly not making it in this. <laughs> As the bizarre and often ridiculous negotiations about creating not only a centre, but the building, this building unfolded in October 2009, I happened, just happened to be watching on TV a rerun. <laughs> <laughs> of a political satire called The Hollow Men. Those of you who don't know, it is set in the office of the of offices of the Central Policy Unit. That is, it's a show that depicted a group of unscrupulous advisors to the Prime Minister who were dedicated <coughs> to his re-election. It was actually planned during John Howard era, the era. Who would have known it fitted poor old Kevin's <laughs> rules so perfectly? Anyway, a show about political spin, about the dizzy news cycle, about bullshit and about overstatement and, and bombacity. <coughs> it actually was a show that reminded me nothing, there's nothing so much as the atmosphere of Maoist hyperbole that I had lived through in my 20s. Once over a private dinner with the Prime Minister at the Lodge, late one night, when we devoted our discussion to my vision for the building, this building that was going to exist, I remarked to Kevin that I felt as though I was living through an episode of this show. In fact, I was living through one particular episode called <laughs> Edifice Complex. <laughs> it's about the announcement of the Prime Minister being able to announce a major new construction in Canberra. And after all the follow all the media involvement and all the rest of it, it ends up being about the announcement of a new traffic roundabout. <laughs> As we know, we always need another one. But I would learn to have greater confidence in Kevin and Ian Chubb to actually deliver on the goods, and we didn't end up with much more than a roundabout. But I just thought you should know that there was this going through. And when I said I was living through an episode of The Hollow Men, Kevin just laughed and said, yep. <laughs> That's all he said, yep. Now, as this illness and dissuetude, both physical and administrative, overtook me five years later, last year in 2014, and as I was auto re relegated to the position of founding director of CIW this year, it was with no, no small measure of smirking delight that I watched the latest offering by the creators of the Hollow Men, the show called Utopia. <laughs> it is set in the offices of the nation of the Nation Building Authority, which is oversight for major infrastructure projects. The show lampoons the gap between suffocating bureaucracy and grand, vaunting ambition. But things have changed. Well, for me anyway. Maybe none of you have noticed. I don't know. What was for me delicious comedy in The Hollow Men is somehow not nearly as funny reincarnated in today's utopia. The reason is that the risible disconnect between bureaucratic folderol and our lived reality is no longer as distant, as funny, or as different as it seemed to be in the past. That's why it's been an ideal time for me, as Mao Zedong put it himself, to retreat to the second line, Tui Ju Ar Xian. So I'll finish by just remarking on something that's just happened the last few days. I've quoted John Gano, but this relates to some wonderful developments and also amusing developments that allow me to, to round off this lecture. Over the last few days, there have been a number of developments regarding China at ANU that promise to carry a little of the frisson of the heady weeks of October, November 2009, when Kevin Rudd and I were formulating the ideas and architecture of this centre. First, there was the announcement that Dr. Frances Adamson, the Australian ambassador in Beijing, would, upon her return to Canberra, take up a role as foreign policy advisor or international affairs advisor to the new Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull. Frances has been a strong supporter of this centre and its intellectual and policy work. She's also made major contributions to the
sent her through her membership of the advisory board and proved to be an extraordinary person for us to have in Beijing at this crucial period. And I have the great pleasure of regarding Francis as a, as a friend and a wise counsel. Then over the weekend, the Saturday paper published an interview by Hamish MacDonald with our incoming Vice Chancellor, Brian Schmidt, who declared that he hoped that this university could develop along the lines of a Harvard. Give us a few billion dollars and we will, I'm sure. <laughs> he wants to change the culture of how we work, quoting him, and engage. We want to be in the center of making sure the government has the best possible advice on policy. Whether the government cares or not, I don't know. We are the national university. We need to be in there working with other national institutions, he says. We have to make sure our research is second to none, taking risks on young people who have great ideas. So I look terribly much forward to him, and this is the term I prefer, deprovincializing this university, kicking out the mud in the bloody chancery and making a real difference to the place. And this coincided with the appearance of Mr. Saturday. Sorry, I, I'm no longer a director, I can say <laughs> <laughs> so soon. Um, and this coincided with an article by Peter, ha Peter Hutch, another friend of this centre, an old friend of mine, in the Fairfax Press, with an interview with the Prime Minister. And it was extraordinary, because he starts it off, shades of Mao, he starts it off, Turnbull starts off by declaring and going so far as to say that the Australian people have stood up. And then he says the same line in Chinese. Ao da li ren min zhan qi la. Which is a, a line of tribute that Chairman Mao spoke in 1949 at the first National People's Political Consultative Congress. So it's very hard to remember. So that's where it all began, after all. 43 years ago with Gough Whitlam, who, by recognizing the People's Republic of China, among other things, expressed a hope that we had indeed, as a country, really stood up. I'm still waiting. And I think if we do indeed stand up, we have, we have sadly some very new and also some very old walls that we have to scale. Thank you. Mm -hmm.